Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the first lecture in our uh, ACT series. Uh, this uh, is entitled Cinematic Migrations. And um, I'm very happy to see you all here and uh, extremely glad to welcome Jaisal Kapadia as our first speaker. And um, I'm also happy to welcome her as a lecturer uh, in ACT. Uh, she's teaching um, in the photography uh, courses and also a great contributor to our overall uh, spirit. <laughs> And discussions. Um, just to give you um, some background um, about Jaisal, um, and I'm going to read uh, this one. Um, she's an artist and a member of the editorial collective that produces the journal Rethinking Marxism. Uh, she is also a frequent collaborator with the 16 Beaver Group in New York. Much of her work engages questions of avant-garde and revolution, people's movement and feminist struggle, and post-capitalist politics. Over the last decade, her collaboration with various artists and activists has led, uh, led her to explore a fragile and dynamic exchange between art and social change. She has taught at various schools and universities in the US and has screened her work at a number of festivals and events, both locally and internationally. Um, and I just want to, to mention um, that I re-met Jaisal uh, at Northwestern um, over, well, I guess about a year and a half ago, um, and realized that we had actually met before uh, through the Whitney Independent Study Program, uh, which she attended, like, decade ago or something. Um, and um, it's, it's great to have her here. Um, and in terms of, I just like to, I will read this description uh, of what uh, tonight's lecture is focusing on. Um, affects and emotions for non-capitalist cinema. What would a cinema that serves its subjects rather than forces of capital look like? a cinema of refusal, a cinematic non-form that breaks away from the conditions set by capital, a cinema made entirely of the process itself that cannot be retained, that disappears and renews itself when recalled, that creates an unforgettable loss, but loss with value on the autonomous side. This, the evening involves performing live annotations and screening of Kapadia's footage shot in Sikkim, India, a dialogue and call and response with the activists who went on a year-long relay hunger strike. What kinds of subject positions would be needed to create this counter-aesthetic practice, one that contains the will to keep social justice alive? Now, in relation to um, cinematic migrations, which is the kind of umbrella term um, that's being used uh, for the series, but it's also a course, um, and it's also a, a project that's taking place over the next two years. Um, uh, I'm really curious to engage uh, and find out more about this particular aspect uh, of tonight's focus. And so, without speaking anymore, I'd like to invite Jezal to begin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Renee. And thank you, everyone, who helped me set this up tonight. It wasn't so complicated, but I'm going to show um, a range of video clips that are in the software, so it was a little tricky, and I shouldn't move the laptop. Okay. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, Sikkim before I get into the discussion of uh, cinematic migrations. Um, it was very appropriate for me to bring Sikkim as the project for this lecture series because um, it is an experiment in thinking, action, and form, literally. A couple of years ago, I 
came across this um, website in one of my emails. I'm a member of the South Asian Women's Creative Collective, and it's a listserv. And it was about, it was called Weeping Sikkim. And I was curious, and you know, most of the time I hear about um, India or the places where I'm from in India through emails because I'm not always there. So I, I started following the link, and it was a relay hunger strike, which was the first of its kind that I had ever imagined. It was a live hunger strike. It was almost unimaginable for me to think of a strategy such as, um, a protest strategy such as hunger strike, um, which was being reported live, but not in a spectacular way, but in a way that is almost heartbreaking, but at the same time, very clear. So it went on for a year, and I followed the link, the website for the whole nine to 10 months from the time I found it. And these are the images that I'm gonna show you to introduce what has followed since my engagement with this uh, subject. So let me just show you these images so you know a little bit about Oops. I want this show up. I don't know if you can see it um, clearly, but these are small cell phone photographs that were on their website. And what I did was I just started downloading them every time they would go up. And there was a blog, and um, it just got more and more serious, as you can see. The handwritten numbers were the number, number of days they were on a hunger strike. So I arranged them um, in the way they were arranged on their website just for my own understanding of what's going on. Um, I didn't know what to make of this. As an artist, I didn't know how, what I'm, why I'm spending so much time with this um, blog. I mean, I, I, I'm an artist, I teach, and I don't consider myself really an activist because if you're an activist, you'd be out in the world doing other things. You'd have a different kind of a community. So I tried to make sense of it, that what is it that I can do with this, I'm, I'm compelled. So I just want you to see, they're small, these images, but there are many more on their website. But what I started doing was, um, I started thinking about how the community themselves, the, the community of activists and the local people in Sikkim, which is um, the, the state in Northeast India, um, it is a unique state. It was not part of India when India became free. Um, it was an independent unit, independent state. It had a king. And uh, in 1962 or mid early 1960s, it overnight became part of India when um, there was a threat that India and China will go to war. So India took care of Sikkim is what I'm told. But so overnight, there's a story that people in Sikkim say that we were Sikkimese last night. We wake up as Indians. So they're still, it's only been 50 years or so, they're still dealing with the idea of nationalism and identity of where to belong. Um, so I, I, this was the first time I had paid attention to something political going, going on in Sikkim. It's in the same country, but as as the way, metro, you know, I'm from Bombay, so as the way the metropolitan life goes, I was not aware of what was going on in other parts of India itself. So I realized that I had actually been there as a teenager on an art trip through art school to make photographs and, and learn about um, photography. <laughs> all the way to Sikkim. And 20 years later, I found out that I'm compelled by the same town, by the same city. And this time, the monks who I had photographed earlier were going on a hunger strike. So that realization was also quite, it made quite an effect on me um, 20 years later, sitting in New York, thinking, how did the paths cross? Or how can I make them cross now that I've, I know that this is happening? So I went there. 
I didn't know what else to do. I'm, uh, I make videos, I take photographs, so I don't normally make long projects that are documentaries. So I thought, okay, here's, um, here's an idea um, to, to think about this subject matter and think about a form for it. So I started thinking about a new form. And to think about a new form for a subject like a hunger strike, which is a very familiar subject to most South Asians because it comes from a direct Gandhian lineage of Satyagraha or you know, the freedom struggle in India, which was a nonviolent uh, protest that a lot of Indians and South Asians at the time they did was the hunger strikes. And um, so I thought, what would be a form that would, you know, I, could I put it in, what form would I, I can't just go and make pictures. So I, this is the first trip. I went there in 2011. Um, after five years of already <laughs> looking at the blog, thinking about the people, uh, reading in news what was happening there, uh, considering um, environmental issues, political issues, developmental issues, reading about all the other related problems in the rest of the world that were also similar to this, <laughs> going to the World Social Forums, uh, you know, so thinking about what is going on. So this was not just, oh, let's go look at a website and see what's happening in another part of the world. It was more, for me, a um, way to think about my own art practice in a in a way that I'd never imagined. So these are pictures just of, um, to give you an idea what the city looks like. Um, the people you saw are all, now I can call them my friends. I visited them, I, I spoke to them. This is the site where the dam is being built. So to give you the context, why are they having a hunger strike? Um, why they did, it's an indefinite hunger strike because um, it's a small mountain, I mean, it's a large, it's a Himalayan region, it's a small village in the Himalayas, and um, their entire village is being displaced because of the dam construction, and it's for, it's not just one or five dams, it's 35 dams, and, you know, we know what happens in other parts of the world as well when dams get constructed for years or decades, you, you remove life forms to build dams, which is by blasting um, the mountains. So it's, a, it's an interesting, it's, an, it, it's, it's just uh, the scale of it is interesting as we see the images in small digital files here, but when you are actually there, you feel that this is, this is wrong. It's bigger than, you know, bigger than what one can imagine as we see things on, in media and photographs. So the first step for me was to go there and see what, what's going on with the dams. And then, of course, the community of protesters, the young students who are just like you and me, they're not, you know, they're, um, they're not uneducated. I, I don't like to use that word, but I say that because um, they have their everyday school life and they're also people who go to monasteries, so they're educated in two different institutions of thought, but they aligned for this cause and went on a hunger strike. Or a, they, it's an indefinite um, hunger strike, but it's still going on. The protests are still going on. So they did this project even for their own sake. So as I encountered them, I thought, there is some, something that we have to think together, which is why present this project to you here today. Um, those were the pictures of the strike, and I want to show you some other slogans that they used for their um, protests. I'm sure you're familiar with the, um, the, the nonviolent, the concept of nonviolence, which is probably predates Gandhi, but he used it for the freedom struggle in India. But what these young people did um, is that they used the idea of satyagraha to, to make it even more urgent for today's context. It's not struggle from slavery or colonization, but from corporate 
power that is taking over their villages, their life, their traditions. Uh, mostly the, the tribes that are situated or that are living, who are living in those mountains, they are the ones who are most affected. But clearly everybody else in the neighborhood is also affected, in neighboring countries, neighboring. So there's Bhutan, there's Nepal, there's Tibet, there's India. So we are talking about that part of the world. And m I'm affected because I saw this and now I'm compelled. And I'm hoping um, how we are all connected through this, that that's the idea to share this project, that actually we're all connected um, because of finance capital, because of the power that goes into making decisions that makes such large scale projects happen. So even if it's in a small way, what are those small ways that in which we are connected is what my my project is trying to do. I'm trying to work with this subject matter, what's happening somewhere else, through images, through my camera, through my uh, interest in working through, and through having a conversation with you. So that's why the idea of um, non-capitalist cinema. I wanted to use the term cinema um, also because before I show you the clips from Sikkim, the interviews that I took, I wanted to show you some um, ideas I had about how this makes sense to me in terms of non-capitalist work or non-capitalist cinema. Um, I put some thoughts here so that I don't forget. The, there are many entry points for me to come into this project. The, the word non-capitalist is different from anti-capitalist, but it's more, it's more for my understanding to think about something other than the mainstream way of making work. It, so on the top right, I wrote down things that I think the work is not, but it could be, but I'm not really thinking about those categories, the, the top left, sorry. Um, cinema verite, documentary practice, social practice, uh, you know, the, the straight-up narrative cinema, non-linear cinema, experimental cinema, alternative films. So these are all things that have inspired me. The works that I've seen in those genres obviously are, are you know, part of my training, <laughs> if, if I can call it. But it's not what is needed for me to think through this project right now. So what is needed, I, I, I don't know yet, but what is really needed for me is to question the flows of um, capital that go into making a project itself. So the other thing I would like to share with you is the idea of opening up the term cinema itself. What is cinema? What is the history of cinema? So when I started thinking about that word, I mean, I'm from India, I, I grew up watching Bollywood films, and for me, cinema is a very loaded term, a, a whole set of relations, but what can I do with it when I am making a, a, a piece of uh, documentary or a video work? Or I tried to break it down to this idea that cinema is something more than it can be, which is a catachresis for me. Um, a term that can be, you know, the meaning is to put into place um, to talk about something that doesn't exist in reality, but it, don't, it exists as a set of relations and conditions. So the best example I can give you about the term catachresis is the word curry, because it doesn't exist. And yet, we use the term. There is no such thing as curry. It's a catachristic term. So it was given that name to be able to talk about a whole range of <laughs> colonial, and uh, other set of relations. So I thought, what if cinema could be thought of as a um, um, term that is catachristic? And then I was thinking also in making this work for tonight to present it to you, I was thinking about the idea of cinema as found object or you know, the classic objet trouvé. How do you decontextualize something and recontextualize it? And what happens when you do that? And for me, I'm not talking about decontextualizing the 
struggle that's happening somewhere else into the art world. I'm talking about decontextualizing myself as an artist and placing me in the struggle because we know what happens when we, we have seen enough practices where people can draw from struggles and use it as art. I'm not imagining that here. That may be okay for some practices, but I'm imagining myself to be decontextualized as an artist and come back and think through the artwork by, by thinking through struggles. Um, I call them struggles because it's not just political activism. It's, it's, it's consciousness building or shifting through aesthetics, through art, through the camera. So I was thinking about cinema as found objects. So what are, what are these things that I'm going to show you today? What will they become? So that's one way to think about, for me at least, the idea of um, found object and non-capture. Can I ever be responsible for telling you the story of what I saw in Sikkim or what I have been seeing or what is going on that I don't even know fully yet? Because a lot is going on. So I, I thought about the idea of non-capture as you know, a process of always knowing, uh, wanting to know more or growing with a subject as the subject also grows. And so that's why this is a, a cinema that is not going to be complete till uh, the struggle is not over. And so it's, it's kind of in solidarity, this is how I'm thinking or as I'm, I'm working on this project, I'm thinking about how I am in solidarity with the people I met, I built relationships with them, would, I, would it be okay for me to have a beginning, middle, and end for this project? It doesn't make sense. So then what does make sense? Um, I don't know. I, I just want to talk about their work and show you what they're saying. That makes sense to me. So these are the other thoughts over here, which we can come back to. But um, I, really, I really want you all to be able to see the process as I am sharing it here. And we can go back to this or your own ideas about what's happening. It's totally... I'm open to questions in the middle. Um, feel free to ask. I'm going to show you some clips. So the first thing I'd like to share is... Um, oh, I hope it doesn't cry. Oh. The first thing I'd like to share is the interviews I did with them uh, a year and a half ago. They were quite a few people I met, and it's, it's enormous, the the footage, and it's experiences that I haven't even processed, and I keep going back to the clips that I would like to show, and each time I show this work, I've shown it three times now, <laughs> each time I share it with an audience, it's different clips, depending on what has sunk in in my head as I show it to you, or what makes sense at the time, so I put some clips together, and this is what makes sense. I'm, I might translate in the middle of the interview that you will watch, because sometimes, I, I don't know, maybe I'm conscious of it, but sometimes the accent may not be clear, and I, I don't know if I can ever do subtitles. It, it doesn't make sense, so I'm, I'm just gonna speak over it if I think that it's not translatable. So this is Dr. Doma, who is a human rights activist. I met her very, uh, you know, so rep, I, I don't know how to explain this, but we were drawn almost to that. I didn't know she was there. I didn't know that I was going to meet a human rights activist there. I went there to meet the students, and I went there to meet the monks. But, of course, if it's such a big movement, there are so many politicians and lawyers and activists involved. So um, she was one of the few people who didn't need an appointment, and I would just... I walked in and she was happy to talk to me. So this is her clip. The forest, mm. all the movements of the animals and you know. Right. So what happened, they know how things, the environments are degrading, the replication of all them. But then some fine people from Delhi see, see a high five people come here. They don't, I don't know whether they visit the site or they don't visit. 
accompanied by some of the government officials. So then they go with a very clean report and then submit before the court. Okay, then court will go by the record. That's a sad state of affairs. Our judiciary is too, I mean, loaded with so much of cases, it seems. So it's not that they go and visit the sites and really do the justice, you know. Because supposing, say, we have recently filed a Tista Stage 3 case. So we had a very good case, but simply because lay person sometimes they don't know the technicalities. But then cases are mainly in the court, cases are dealt in a technical manner. So this is just got dismissed on the ground of technicality. It's a, it's a, it's a so what she's discussing is we're slurping tea on the other side and also learning how to use the camera for the first time. This was a bulky camera. Um, my uh, photographer friend who was also uh, taking still images while I was using the video camera, we just sat there for three hours and she explained to us the whole struggle from a lawyer's point of view. Um, what she was describing, and she'll continue to describe, is how they keep losing cases in the court. Um, the, the 40 student activists, who you will see in, few, in, in other clips, they obviously, the, the government the officials, the police, didn't want them to be sitting in the middle of the street protesting for too long, as we know from our recent uh, you know, Occupy movement people here. So they don't like people sleeping in the streets for protest purposes or for any other purposes for that matter. And so they were jailed and it became a, they were uh, termed as criminals for protesting. So she was the lawyer who was fighting for the case. But what she's really talking about is um, the real problem, which is not just how to get them out of jail because they were protesting, but the real problem was that the dams you know, they, they shouldn't be built. And the city, the, the activists filed a case. And this is the experience that each time you would go to the court, you would come back rejected um, because the power, the corporate power, the, the central government power is much bigger than local power. Sikkim is a tiny, tiny state. And we're talking about, you know, less than 10, I don't know, probably 10, 20,000 people who are the tribal um, villagers who are getting affected, the Lepcha tribe. So I'll continue. It's uh, quite a sad, because what happened, it uh, sends a wrong message to the activists, to the ground labor, because it's, uh, that is what we see the whole wide Nexal movement in India. Yeah, yeah, they take up arms. It's a frustration, yes, yes. because there's no point. They first try the uh, judicial, I mean, they try their the level best to, you know, get a justice from all the system which has been put into by it. So when they approach the system, they find it's, a, it's not a human. They don't understand the human language, basically. It's too much of technicality. And they get uh, confused with all that. Then the simple people, they realize there's no point going to court or any of the... So now what happened, even the Government of India, Ministry of Environment and Forest, they go by what the government gives them a report. They go by the, what the government have chosen, some of the experts, so-called environmentalists or some experts. So they always give a program. And if I have appointed you, I paid you. So definitely you'll give a report in my favor. So Of course. So that, that is how the ministry also give a clearance. So these are issues. That Mr. Atu was a petitioner in one of the cases. Yeah. He knows law very well on environment land acquisition. <laughs> <laughs> There's one more clip with him. Um, he, was, he was an amazing person. I, I had been trying to find him for days, and he was just sitting there in her office. That's how we met. So no phone calls. This is a really, truly telepathic or non-capitalist way of working. We didn't even have cell phones that were working. Uh, in such a short period, but he was the person who I wanted to talk to. His name was on the website. And he's also hard of hearing, so it was difficult to communicate with him. But, so she asked him to comment something, and this is what he says. He was very funny. At this moment, we cannot talk about our lands. 
if we talk about protection of our land, then we will be tainted as anti-project, anti-development. Don't say anything about your lands. You talk about project, hydro project, big industry that will bring you the money. Your land won't produce any money. That is the viewpoint of our government of India and government of Sikkim. People are not allowed to talk anything against forest protection, wildlife protection, river protection, lake protection. Talk about development, industry, hydro projects, nothing else. That is the lesson has been taught to us by our governments. Wildlife. They are living in the forest, in the jungle. Why do you want to protect them? For what purpose? They won't bring you the money. They won't bring you the development. These things are being taught in our state by the state government as well as the central government. Wildlife, nothing. National park. No. Destroy them. We want only the development projects. Nothing to do with elephants in the plains. Nothing to do with the snow leopards in the Himalaya. Himalayan langurs must be destroyed by the project. Don't talk about the fish in the river. They cannot keep you living. That is the situation we are facing here. We I should talk about the river, which is the big source of um, their energy, actually. It runs through the Hima from the the top of the Himalayas and the mountains and flows down to all the way to Bengal and to the ocean. So it's being harnessed. The river in, in, that he's talking about is the River Tista. And the activists call themselves affected citizens of Tista River, ACT. And he's talking about um, all the, you know, the, the, he was a minister of the forest for a while. So he's talking about the fish, the snow leopards, the deer, and of course, through that, he's also suggesting that the government does not want to listen to the people. It's the first encounter um, many years ago, but even recently, that, that they do not want to, the government of India does not want to hear the, the voice of the villagers or the tribal people. So he's describing that process that in a very passionate way, that don't talk about this. We don't want to hear it. Bring development because the dams are, of course, going to make a lot of electricity, which will be sold to a lot of states and the neighboring countries. And all these uh, develop developers, um, hydro power project owners or conspirators are either the state of Sikkim and the corporations from abroad. So it's all international and local. But clearly, the tribal people are not in their imagination. I want to show you, I'll come back to this clip again. Um, I want to show you the, the site where this is happening. So the other issue is that the government is secretly going in and doing eminent domain, buying up village by village, houses by houses, and um, they 
they buy them off so cheap that the people well, don't who, who live there don't know the, the real value of money or they do know the value Sorry. of money but they use it in a different way so it's not enough money clearly and so they find themselves on the street within a year for the land that is their ancestral land and so these people over here think that they, they have lived here for centuries it's not that they're migrants or I'm an app, you know, so the, it's not something new. They, this is their home. But the idea of giving up your home for a bag full of money is a, is a, very, it's a very wrong thing because you're making them homeless and then they will use up the money that, that can never be enough for a home that is lost. And then they are um, given these compensatory spaces. They, they, these are the rehab colonies. or uh, <clears throat> They're not exactly called rehab colonies, but they're rehabilitation sites. And you can see that they're barren, empty after five years of having been there. Nobody wants Nobody, to live here after they having, it's not yeah, even after lived, yeah. they have their mountains and rivers and the usual community, the whole village. How, how, why would they be, why would they choose to live here? I'll show you a clip um, with one of the monks, who is a very inspiring person. And I'm, um, he actually, Sonam Paljor is his name, and he went on a hunger strike in the 80s. It's not a new issue. It's just that the scale of this topic of building dams in India has grown so much in the last 10 to 20 years that he is revisiting this, this um, problem in his city, in his land, in his state. Uh, this is, he's now in his, I, I think, mid-50s to late-50s. But he was um, already on a hunger strike in late-80s, and he talks about it a little bit in this clip. That. Oh, how did that happen? You see, I think Gandhi got lots out of Buddhist teachings, and it is the protest through nonviolence. It is, it is to show, I mean, it's within our culture, no, we're not violent. We, we don't believe in violence. And, and I think he sort of showed us, look, you don't have to pick up a stick and knife, and you can express your, you know, dissatisfaction this way. And I'm so he has an American accent, as you can <laughs> tell. He um, studied at Brown University when he was young. He got a scholarship to come to America, and he studied uh, in the 70s in, at Brown. And then he went back and continued his monastic practice, and he started a school. And then he got involved with the local issues. Um, the, the hunger strike was one of them. When I did a hunger strike, I told, took a full responsibility on myself. I am, was willing to, if I am to die, I was willing to die, not for, you know, for anything, but I felt that, well, somebody's got to take on and express. And I mean, my hunger strike wasn't waiting for projects. I, I did spend time in meditation and prayers. I called on the the spirits of this land, we have the spirits of this land. And that's where, you see, in modern education, it seems like you have to see the six senses have to somehow feel it out. No, if it doesn't, if it's not in the, in a, in a, in an area of your six senses, it doesn't exist. But there are so many things you don't see, no? It exists, it is here. And just because you are so thick doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So, and, and when we see, um, our elders have said that Mountain Kanchanjunga is a protecting deities. And a thousand years ago he has, I, I know you have to believe that it wasn't some you know, crazy fancy kind of uh, after taking a drug. It's not like that. 
it has been, we have books, we have rituals, we, we do have proof of, you know, I mean, not, not that I can show you, but they exist. They're taking care of this land. But this so-called civilized modern thinking is like so egocentric. You know, this ego has to see object and subject and object relationship. And, and then it is so, it's so, um, what do you say, you know, it is, you can't, you can't do anything about it, it is so, but powerful. You know, it's like dozer. They don't care. No, the, the government doesn't care. Big companies are coming in. It really, really, it's just, it, we find it, um, even the courts. I mean, the, the one, one avenue is, one avenue we have is like peaceful demonstration, satyagraha. And the other is going through the court and saying, well, there are laws. We have old laws in, in Sikkim. Zonggu was protected during the time of our kings for hundreds of years. Even the people from other parts of Sikkim cannot settle in that. That's a sacred land. You know, that's a land where the lepchers live. And has been, has been respected for ages. And now, you know, the, these companies going in, drilling, digging. You should see, I mean, that is a sacred, really sacred land. And you need in this world, we need sacred, sacred, not in the sense of, you know, religious fanatic things, it's not. Not the sacred doesn't mean either Buddhist or religious. Sacred just means a power source of life, life power source. And those, those are in the world, you know, I mean, these are, that, these are the things. So how do you preserve them? You have to give a name called sacred. Well, the sacred. What does sacred mean? Do not destroy. Just let it be. That's what, how you have to understand sacred. You know, do I worship the sacred? You don't have to worship. But don't go to the extreme of destroying the sacred. The sacred means just let it be. Just, just. In, in Sikkim, in a way. Um, he spoke spontaneously for three days with no appointments, nothing. I just called him and he would turn off all his five different cell phones that he had. He's a very uh, popular person, not only in the monastery that he is at, uh, living in, it was a tiny little room, but he's also, he has two schools now. He runs two schools and he's also a very inspiring figure for the young generation, the activists, the Lepcha tribal community. It's, uh, I don't, I mean, they use the word tribal for themselves in a very particular way. So I hope, you know, I hope that, I don't know if I should use it or not, but anyway, they are, they are um, a, a very particular tribal community and the land that they're living in is also protected as he was describing. It's one of the world's fewer um, bio reserves that is left and you can't just go and build there. You can't buy land there. You have to inherit it or you have to be a mountains person or a plains person as he calls it. So it's already, it, it is a special place. It's also the world's biggest, in India, it's one of the, uh, India's biggest bio reserves. So he goes on to talk about other issues, um, which I'll come back to. How are we doing? Any thoughts? If anybody wants to share anything in the meantime. I, I have lots of clips. <laughs> yeah. How many people were displaced totally? Well, it's a process. They are being displaced as we speak, or they, they fight, and they struggle, and they, they, they don't leave. It's um, the, the community that I met, I mean, there is no such number, but they are very small. They haven't yet left. It's probably five to 10,000, I could be wrong, but it's a very small number who are actually being affected. 
because that's why the government of India doesn't care because it's such a tiny number. I mean, think about India as the world's second largest population. They don't care. Um, so yeah, it's a very, you know, the, the scale of things is global, but yet it's so small in the scale of things that um, it's not noticed. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely, you know, the, you're not supposed to build dams over there. So the, the rights are in, on the side of the people. So that's why they, ha they have been winning the case. It's just that the process is so slow. Even if the lawyer says that they are, you know, rejected each time they go, they win in a small, small measure, which means, when I say winning, out of 35 to 40 large dams, maybe one or two will stop the construction, that's a victory for them. I even if you stop blasting for a while. How large are the dams? I mean, it, it's, it's huge. The, we're talking statewide. I, I don't know how large, but it's huge, the scale. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's no. In the sense of, uh, is your, are you seeking to make a documentary that includes several, various voices? Or no. are you, no? Okay. Why? Because I'm not seeking to make a documentary. Uh, I wasn't interested in talking to them. It was very clear to me that I'm, I'm compelled to talk to people who are thinking about their land in a way that, um, in a way that is uh, important to life, you know, it's a, it's a, I don't know, it's a struggle that is also compelling because of life that I see in New York here. I see some ties there between their struggle and our struggle here. It's got to do with finance capital. At least that's one way of thinking about it. But I mean, I'm, I, I, I don't want to tell anybody's story here, so. I didn't select people to talk to, I just showed up there. Mm -hmm. I can continue showing clips. Do you, do you know if there's any coal-fired power plants in that area that they're planning on shutting down as a, as a, as a swamp? Because often that's yeah. the justification they use, right? So like, if you can shut down five yeah. coal plants and build uh, six, Sorry, I don't know if everyone could hear that. Um, I, my question was, are there any coal-fired power plants in the area that they're shutting down? Because there's usually an environmental benefit to building hydroelectric dams versus coal-fired power plants, natural gas power plants. I didn't hear of any of that in the narrative that was online. Because it's really, um, it's, it's much, much mega than you know, something versus something else. It's, it's at a very... Um, how can I call it? It's development in a way that is uh, what's going on in China. So even if they did shut down something small and started to replace it with newer technology, the core issue here is that it's much bigger than any, any one of us locally can imagine over there. They don't need that much electricity. They want to sell it. It's a trade issue. I guess what I'm asking though is, is there a utilitarian benefit like, are these people, sac is, the, uh, is, is there sacrifice in vain, or is it for the betterment of mankind? That's a big question for us to think about. Because if it is better for mankind, then, then it's, worth, it's worth trying to find a, a solution that works for everybody that, that, that's overall going to, you know, overall clearly a benefit. I think it's a very, you know, compelling question. Is it worth the mankind? The question is, which mankind? So they are saying that, it's at our cost, but, but and I'm so. About future generations, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. They are also that. aware of that. They are not against development. They don't. I mean, in one of the clips, the monk actually explains very clearly. Even the activists say that it's not like we're against development. It's just that the mega development at the speed and the cost that it's happening is obviously wrong to them, and it should be to a question for us to think about that. You know, what kind of price is being paid for what? So, I mean, like I said, it's, um, it's not numbers or this versus that. It's uh, 
consciousness shifting that happens when you go there. And even if you don't go there, we can talk about these very questions that you asked. What's the worth of electricity or speculative electricity? It's more speculation. It's in the 35 years that have been projected while the dams that will be built will be continue to be built, um, the dams that will continue to be building, and people continue to be losing their traditions and their lives. Absolutely. Yeah. There was a, a sign in the beginning that said um, something about uh, rejecting economic development for its own as its own right, and I, so it's not. It's not that economic development is bad or good, but it's understanding what the um, what's sort of like embedded in that notion, which is something like it's or mankind winning or these people losing out. But who are we talking about and when? I, th I think maybe what I was getting at is the yeah. precedent that was set in China with the Three Gorges Dam, where sure. the 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 human benefit, the environmental benefit of that dam is enormous. Like the, the, the sacrifices that people made were also enormous, mm -hmm. but over the next 500 years, that the benefits far away the negatives, right? And that's just on a purely on, on an environmental assessment. I mean, but that should be contested. And there is research being done that shows that actually dams cause more harm than benefit. So I was just looking for that file. I actually have something that I downloaded from their website. But, you know, all these things are valid thoughts, even they have thought about it. They're all lawyers and the students who I met, the activists, they're, you know, the people who you saw in those images who were doing the hunger strike. They are very eloquent in this matter. They've been following this for a decade now. But they have all these um, researchers, you know, uploaded on their website. So we can actually learn a lot from this by just going to the website. But... That is not my only concern here. The, the real thought for me here is, um, what do I do with, uh, you know, the, the, how am I, as an artist, thinking about this in, in the language of aesthetics? And, you know, why should an artist be interested in this? Or should, should an artist be interested in this? Maybe that's not even a good question. Everybody should be interested in this. But, what do we do as artists? I teach, I make images. How do I bring it in a form that raises more consciousness in us about the conditions that are in play rather than a Q&A of you know, numbers, of this is good or bad kind of stuff? I don't know if that's making sense, but... I'd like to show that image again of um, the other examples of documentary practices have been um, you watch something and you come back home and, and it's a documentary. You think about it in a different way. But what if it's not a documentary like you were asking me that, you know, it's, it, it's a process of change there and in us in thinking about people's lives and about how art should be, how documentaries should be, maybe. How they should be screened, how they should be distributed. Yeah, this was the image I was looking for. Yeah, the idea of what would be the form that brings into visibility the condition that they're going through, rather than the question of dams. It's not just dams, it's also, you know, villagers who will lose their land and their languages and um, a tradition and a different kind of loss that is not just benefit and cost thing. Maybe I go back to some more clips which are... In, in Sikkim, it, in a way, used to be these caves and the sacred land there used to be human beings, special human beings, who would live there. We, we need to increase them. We've, we've lost them. These, these great masters, 
Now, when we say great masters, they're not preachers, really. You know, um, you know, in in the West, you know, the, you would say, "Oh, he was a great preacher." Like, I mean, um, a guy like what? What was that famous black guy? Martin Luther King. King, right? His speech, yeah, you know, I one day, I have a dream, yeah? Uh, ours is not like that. It's not about dream. It's about being in an unknown place and affecting the whole psyche. That's, yeah, we have to accept the karma. And then accepting karma doesn't mean pacifism. You know, it doesn't mean you shouldn't react, lay down and die. It doesn't mean that. It really means to really look in and start to clean up or look at your own ways of what you're doing, which will call on these consequences. For example, it basically, in a way, looks at your greed, you know, you want to sell the land. I also met a um, shaman over there. I would like to show you some clips. In some places where I visited, I was more free with the camera. In some places, I was, the camera was on a tripod and I was sitting down. And some of it was I gave the camera to them, whoever was around me, to shoot because, you know, like I said, I wasn't seeking a particular style of filmmaking or I didn't have an idea in mind. Um, so that's why the footage looks the way it does. I wasn't trying to control the image. This was a very tasty snack that they offered. <laughs> The person here in the image is Gatso, who was, um, uh, he ran a homestay, which is like a bed and breakfast, a very new concept for the people living there. Which is, he said he was doing that very recently, he started the homestay to be able to talk to tourists about what was going on. He's an activist, he also went on a hunger strike. So amongst many things that these people are doing to bring awareness, it's not just the protests, it's not just the uh, you know, court cases or going to jail and uh, being imprisoned. And then they're also trying to do other things which are under the radar or how do you spread a conversation with someone. So I just met him on some travel agent, hooked me up with him and I said, oh, you are the person I'm here to meet. And I was staying in his homestay. So he took me up to the village where his aunt and his uh, entire extended family, they also took part in the hunger strike. So I was just playing with the beautiful forms of food that I hadn't, yeah. snacks that I had never seen in my life. We, we go to him when we feel ill. When we feel ill, we go to his <laughs> house. When I was in the doctor, since this is not translated, so he's, he's a shaman, he's a local doctor, but he's saying that he is not a doctor, clearly. He's saying that I, have, I can tell you the symptoms that people come to me, but I also would like to talk about what's going on here. That's why he says that I am who I am. So everybody in the village is rethinking their roles you know, the, the lawyer was rethinking his role, the monk was rethinking his role as a citizen, as a monk. So they're all shifting professions, identities, um, consciousness. They're all interested, even the grandmother who I met, even she was saying that, you know, I want to think about the future generation, which I would normally think in a different way, but now I'll do it through their process of protests. So everybody was involved in this struggle. It's not just... Um, young kids. So what she says is, uh, 
Of course, she will. If if you all start. Sorry, this footage is very dark. There was no she light. She will join it. And I didn't have a flash. The thing, because mm -hmm. it's not about you know she did some job, and she mm -hmm. you know uh, did some part of it. It's it's like this is mm -hmm. a matter of survival, not 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 just a, you know part of you know some thing. It's, she will again come back if you know things starts again. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> There's no place, such peace place like this, what mm. she's saying. Mm -hmm. Protect, even if those companies are there, how do we make them responsible for the people around them? You know? Well, I was saying, you know, one of the things, you know, people are saying, you got to negotiate. Negotiate what? I mean, from what point of view? Negotiate like this? <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's the only way to negotiate. Please give us, you know, this. There are 5,000 families in, in Zonggu. Uh, we, we need to educate the kids in the best modern education. Now, not village school, I'm sorry. Uh, you know? find the best school and give them scholarship and have them study. And if we're not able to cover in 15 to 20 years, then they can have it. They can just take a lot. Anything they have, they can take. But give us a chance, right? That's all, that's all I'm, I'm just asking just for the chance. Look, give us a chance. If we can do it in 10 years, you, you just have it. Take it, take it, whatever. But you need, in order to be fair, you have to give us a chance. Nothing. I mean, tourism is one thing, yeah? But with all these things, mountain being taken down and tunnel being dug, the river being diverted, who's going to come here? If that is the industry, and that has a chance for the natives to do something about it, employment, whatever. And so if you take it, everything away from the natives, I think that's why the Maoist movements are on, you know? I mean, I don't think somebody won't, loves to take a gun and get killed. I, I, I don't think that exists there. But I think they were saying, well, you know, we have to be forced to take up arms. And that would be sad because what that is sad to the humanities because then you have said our way of life, our belief, our philosophy of, of um, objecting to the world hasn't worked. Let's use ammunition, fight and kill. And I think that when that happens, we, we as a humanity lose. So if these pockets, small pockets, are left in the world, and we go and, you know, jab and force them to pick up, like, you know, a rifle which was made in 1920s to say, well, this is the expression of our struggle, then, then, then what are we doing? We should shut down all the universities then. Well, what, what is the point then? Where, where are we? In the bigger picture, where are we? You need people believing in nature and peace. We, more and more we need people, you know? I mean, you talk to your friends, I bet they all love peace. But the decision are made to bomb the places, you know? They go bomb there, they go bomb there. And we'll just talk. But even just talking like that, it, it's important. That's why you're here, traveled all the way. This is important too. You know, it's not, not important. Then slowly, people like you are coming. You know, no Zonggu guys invited you and say, listen to our problem. No, slowly, they say, the flower will attract the bee, the lake will attract the swan. But you have to be a flower, 
and the lake. <laughs> Keep showing. I'm I'm open to questions if or thoughts if people have um, experienced such struggles here. Yeah, Hazra. Uh, I'm I'm very moved with also uh, all that has been said here. I'm wondering, uh, well, there are many things that, uh, the questions that one could pose here. One is about the form you are choosing. Um, and I find this also format very interesting of this uh, also clip showing, but also how you talk about it to it. And maybe this is, is that part of uh, this new idea of cinema that you're proposing or it's, I would be curious to, uh, to know more about that. And maybe, I don't know, I found it very um, interesting what the monk has said about education. Maybe, you know, your role as artist could be in part in this whole uh, problem to establish some kind of conversation or educational exchange with them. Uh, especially now that you at MIT, we actually have programs <laughs> Uh, that you can use um, and and to continue working with this. So I would be curious to know about your plans, how to develop this further. Yeah, I I, I want to you know make it go in the way that it will, in a way that uh, it makes sense for all of us too. Should it be a documentary? Should I keep funding? things in this project? You know, that's a big question. They are also thinking about funding. So I, I'm learning through them. And um, your first question was that, you know, the form of this project. I, I, I honestly don't want to foreclose anything for this because what can you do for a hunger strike? Would be, it's a humbling thing, I mean, to, to deal with a topic like that. So I'm very attached to the people who I've met and to turn them into characters in a story would not be okay for me. So it's far from that. So it's an experience, and I, I don't, I mean, I tend to work on things as long as they work with me. So the idea is that I get transplanted there, not just through finances that will, through institutions or you know, places of grants that'll take me there, although I did visit the place with a grant you know, took me there. So it's not that institutional help is not a good thing. It's just that the question here is a much deeper question for me and for all of us. How do we, how do we talk about capitalism or the violence of capitalism that the monk was also saying? You know, how can we recognize these things in our own lives here? And of course, I, sure, I, I don't know if I can actually do an educational you know, collaboration, but I am doing one right now as we speak. <laughs> or I'm hoping that you can do that with me, you know, if not now, then as we leave the rooms, you know. So it's, it's more about, for me, it's more about energy shifting. So it's a, it's a different, you know, one of the things the monk also said, um, I don't know if you remember the images with all the prayer flags in the mountains. He said that that's also a speech act. I was thinking about your work, Renee, because the prayers, the, the flags are in the wind fluttering, and he was saying that that is a speech act. Um, it's, it's also an, it's a prayer, but it's, you don't just always have to speak everything and do everything. You can also send it out in the world, messages, through different forms. So I thought that was really powerful for me as an artist to think about. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Coming back to form, because um, in the example that you just used is also um, compelling uh, as a speech act. I was just thinking that um, what you're enacting right now, it's all what you were mentioning in the beginning and what we've talked about somewhat in the seminar about cinema and it being something that's very, it, it's almost like um, 
it isn't as if it's something that's completely realized. Uh, that cinema, in a broader sense, is also about potential. And so it seems as if you are engaging in that um, attempt uh, to move closer to something like that in this process of showing us um, these, the clips and the things. But I think one of the aspects uh, of uh, the virtual mm. part, as well as the portable <laughs> part of cinema, um, as an aspect of what you could imagine, uh, is something also to think about. Because it's sort of like um, the way that something might be able to circulate and be repeated, um, something that you could return to when you're not there. That's one of the things that is also um, interesting to think about. And in the sense of the way the banners or the flags yeah. function, it's something that a person doesn't need to be there for it to exist because it has a form. And so in terms of your quest, <laughs> I think it's interesting to continue thinking about, well, how, you know, what kind of way would be, um, what would be satisfying uh, yeah. in the way that you would like to, to work? Because I do think, I, I really, uh, it resonates with me a lot, um, this wish not to um, sort of encapsulate the people <laughs> uh, or to make it, make this into a documentary, a traditional documentary form. Yet, in terms of what you're asking uh, for, you know, us to, if we are going to be, to return to the question and to be stimulated to, to think about it, we need to encounter something in a form somehow. <laughs> and, um, and so right now, this is the live version, and I, mm -hmm. and I like it. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I like your, I think your discussion of the different aspects that we're looking at is also, it, it, it makes the whole thing. Uh, it makes it so, so different than if we were to, hear, to see it in another, as a, as a film in that way. But it's something to continue yeah. thinking about, I think. Yeah. Thank you, Rene. Have you uh, shown these clips in this kind of way to the people who you filmed and took pictures of and had this kind of discussion? Oh, I had lots of discussions with them while I was there, but I haven't been back. But I definitely think about that a lot. What would it be you know, to show them the clips? But to be very honest, they videotaped half a lot of the stuff some of the stuff, which I haven't shown today, but I do have a lot of footage that they were working with the camera themselves. But I, I mean, and then had the discussion about what they would think should be done with the clips. Never came up, because it was almost that the clips were just uh, like breathing. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they also use technology. They have actually this whole subject can be found on YouTube on their website, on Vimeos. There are actually people have made documentaries on this. They themselves have. So it, it, you'll see some of these people, if you Google weeping Sikkim, it'll be there. You'll see some of these monks and some of the activists there. So again, for them too, it wasn't that like, oh, an artist with a camera is showing up. It was more that I, I was hanging out with them and they were hanging out with me and we were walking together. They videotaped me, too, with their own camera. They're very media savvy. Um, th there's a whole other aspect to this work that I haven't, I mean, they've made their own, they've cut their own, own album. Uh, kids have sung songs, written songs. Um, there's a whole documentary that I have on my hard drive that I could show you of their own witnessing of their own protests. So they have a whole archive of their media. But I don't know, I think about this a lot. What, what can I bring back to them next time? So I, I do take to heart Azra's question. What would a, a collaboration as, as a teacher or as an artist be if there was an opportunity? I don't know. The distances are so great that I can't even 
and the violence of what's going on over there is so immense that I, I don't know what in truth can be done, but it's, it's overwhelming sometimes. But as a documentary filmmaker myself, it's just, it's a lot to think about because what you're talking about is a lot of the same struggles you'd be going through with a traditional documentary. And of course, over time with documentaries, it's expanded into, especially when you're looking for funding and what is out there, it's like, well, the, it has to live on after you make the film. And there's so many different interactive pieces, whether it's it ties into something online that's constantly updated. You're interactive watching it online, and you can flip to something else. If you're going to have it go and teach with it and curriculums and courses taught, or if you're going to bring the people from the film with you, or if you're going to teach people that you're filming with how to film themselves and tell their own stories. So it's definitely since Cinema Verite and in the 60s expanded and this idea and ever since the internet came out, this whole idea of, well, nonlinear and yeah. where you can take your stories and leaving the traditional cinema. And it's so hard when you try to get push boundaries sometimes, just the basic ones of, um, well, I don't want them to be characters because I don't want to put them in that world. But then you're showing clips to us, and in our head, they're becoming characters on the screen. We're taking what we can out of them. And it's it must be like this theoretical thing in your head going through this process, which I can't even imagine, is like trying to break the boundaries, but there's certain boundaries that you just need to, as soon as you pick up a camera that you're not going to be able to get away from. And of course, you have the training of traditional, everything on the top left side of what we know and how to deliver mediums and just, and I mean, everything with how you get to be with your, with the people that you're around, whether you don't, they're not subjects, they're just people, and I it's just go back a really to something you mentioned before. I forget uh -huh. that actually I'm taking it. I mean, it's not so. I mean, I, s I say overwhelming. It's because of what they're going through, that emotional aspect of when you hear the stories and you feel moved, and uh, you know that what you you know we choose to listen to. It depends on how you interact with information and experience but i mean i'm not um like i'm not thinking about this all the time in my head it's not something that's in my head i would like to emphasize that that this is something affective i like to talk about it i did a lot of talking about it for the last every time i've met people and since the last five years so that's a form of uh communication and storytelling and i i'm very comfortable with um the images that I showed, the clips that I showed, if they became characters for you, hopefully you, you will remember them and think about them. But I was just suggesting that, you know, it's not a new avant-garde technique that I'm looking for. It is nothing new, actually. I don't want to look for anything new. I was just, you know, affected by this. So therefore the title, I thought about the title really carefully. It is an affect and emotion for a non-capitalist cinema, because if I searched for something new, I would first have to know that there is an old and it's not working. I do know that I'm aware that, you know, the flows of capital, the way they are going, are not working. That much I know, but in terms of documentary practices, there have been amazing films that have inspired me, you know, so it's just the question of what is, what is it that we can all uh, do together as filmmakers and as artists, as theorists, as scientists, as writers. It's all of our forms that need to be rethought, maybe, maybe. So yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to say that it, it, it's not something that brings me down, actually. They, they, these people inspire me, and they liked hanging out with me, too. They liked meeting an artist and not a, a person from the news or the media, you know, because they have been covered by the local camera people. So it's a dual exchange, which I want to think about. Like what can we do as an experience together? Um, thanks. This is l less of a question about how to make a film and more of a question about hunger striking. Um, I th I'm interested in your comment. 
uh, if you have any. Um, my, un my impression is that in India or South Asia, there's a kind of respect for hunger striking having to do with traditions of uh, protest and um, going quite, quite a ways back. Um, and, and it having a, a certain efficacy also. Um, and I'm also mindful of the use of hunger strikes in uh, political pri IRA prisoners in, in, in Ireland who actually struck, refused to eat uh, uh, unto death yeah. um, to protest their imprisonment by, by the British government. Um, in the United States, my impression is nobody really gives a damn. Um, we have incarcerated people in Guantanamo for 10 or 11 years now. I don't know if anybody in this room knows very much about their conditions of imprisonment, how many have been on hunger strikes, the force feeding. Um, and I don't think, and that's not really meant to be a big criticism of the people here, but I just don't think there's a lot of interest in this in the United States. And it, it is a striking um, sort of comparison to me that the, the valence, if you will, that this has in, 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 in South Asia and the sort of complete lack of interest in the reality of similar protest and suffering that the U.S. government, our own, those of us who are U.S. citizens, our own government is directly uh, responsible for. And I'm just thinking, those are just some of my thoughts, and I'm wondering if you have any, any thoughts in response. I have lots of thoughts, and I'm very happy you took the conversation in that area because that is the, the reason why I want to talk about hunger strikes. Not because I live in India, I, I don't live there anymore, I visit, I travel, I am from India, but the story is not just about them. I'm very aware of um, our lack of, including me, our lack of uh, attention to how we treat our own people in prisons or in, you know, not even in prisons, but people who live like that in real life. You know, yeah, I, I, I'm very much with you. I don't know if anybody else would like to speak to that, but hunger strike, I, it almost seems like, like you said, they don't care a damn. We had the Occupy movement. They don't know what to say about that. They don't care a damn, right? We could say that again. We also, we also have, I mean, and I thought it was really interesting how you used the word data, right? I'd never mm -hmm. actually heard anyone from, I'd, I'd actually never heard anyone from a, sort of an ancient, uh, you know, a country with that much history use the term native before because where I'm from, I'm from British Columbia, and when you say native, you're talking about First Nations people, right? So, um, which are people that have lived there for thousands of years, and there's tons and tons of examples of the environment being protected by a coalition uh, or a alliance between environment, you know, sort of your average sort of, uh, you know, European uh, person of European descent, uh, environmentalist living in British Columbia, uh, forming an alliance with natives who whose land it right, rightfully belongs to, uh, and then stopping or blocking the government and corporate entities from doing whatever they want, or at least a bare minimum ensuring that the proper environmental uh, reclamation efforts are made or environmental protection is, is put in place, as well as social programs to mi you know, mitigate or minimize the impact on those communities. But I think maybe like, uh, yeah, I mean, here, here we are in North America, you're talking about hunger strikes. I mean, I mean they, they take up weapons. Like na where I'm from, natives pick up guns and they, and they make blockades and that's how they stop things from happening. And the, probably the reason why they have to do that is because hunger strikes probably don't work very well. I guess, but um, one actually one of the biggest problems where I'm from in British Columbia is the N, uh, N Bridge pipeline, um, uh, trying to pipe uh, oil or tar sand oil out of Alberta, um, and there's a it's the same it's like a same fundamental struggle. It's basically like you said, it's like capitalist forces um, forming partnerships with governments, and then sort of overruling or overwhelming the rights of the minority for what they describe as the greater good. And I think that that's where I find your work to be the most interesting, is that you've 
really hit the nail on the head that that there's um, there's so many overtones in your work that give rise to questions of what is the greater good and is the greater good so important that these kinds of sacrifices need to be made? And if the answer to that is no, these sacrifices don't need to be made, then that means that they're all in vain. And if they're all in vain, then there's then then the system it really is screwed. But it's my belief. I, I maybe maybe this is just a lingering. Um, a lingering feeling that we can save the system. And I do believe we can save the system, so I guess it's not lingering, actually. It's a, a fairly strong conviction that there's maybe there's a better way. Maybe this whole s entire system for development and the long-term survivability of the human race can be reframed and can be adjusted uh, to become more suitable, more socially just, and, uh, and ultimately, environmentally, be more... Um, uh, either benign or an actually enrich our biodiversity. There's so many things you mentioned. I, I would love to chat with you about many of these things you mentioned, but the word native is, um, the monk was using it because they, they are, they do consider themselves as native Indians in India, um, living there for centuries, and they call themselves native. But you're right, we have stopped thinking about that term as if they don't exist. And you know, we, we think about, like you said, they pick up arms. And they, he did mention that the question of violence is very much present, even there and here. But we don't even, we, we almost don't see it. You know, it's a question of guns, of violence, of um, uh, as the monk was saying, if they pick up arms, that will be very sad. So what are we teaching our youth? In a way that where is the dialogue happening about uh, nonviolence, violence, or other ways of expressing struggles? When we think of Maui's struggles, he was saying that there, that's what is going to become. So it's, it's at a stage where it is not that yet. They're still following the Gandhian protests. And, we in schools can, or we in the art world can, or we in our science labs can think about that. What, what is the output of what's happening outside these rooms? What change could we bring if it's conversation is one thing? But we're talking gadgets and military action and banking systems and much bigger things. It's a collective effort. So I don't know, I can't take on, I mean, it's a much larger conversation if anybody else wants to. Discussion of um, like a global circulation of finances. And within that, I don't know if this question is so much for affect or what the function is, but uh, since this is about the conditions that, and relations that make this film possible, in this instantiation, it'd be interesting to hear about the funding and where you got the funding for the film as part of you know, framing what non-capitalist film might be. So did you... I hope it's not a naughty question. Just no, no, no. Are you connecting funding with uh, capitalism? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess just finances in general. I think there was, an, like, it's an abstract statement that we are related to this dam, and we are, and I think those links are some, some are visible, some are less. And similarly, yeah. I mean. I can talk about that. Yeah. This is my teaching a whole class on non-capitalist life right now. I don't see the, I mean it is, it, capital is one thing, capitalism is something else. And funding can come from uh, any source and you can use it for any end. Uh, just logistically, I was funded by, uh, Northwestern University. I was on a residency and they gave me money to do this very project. They asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, this is what I've been thinking about. And I wrote it out and showed them the pictures and they let me use the money to go there. Um, but, you know, it's a very interesting thing to think about that capital is benign as Gayatri Spivak uses it. It's capitalism that we are struggling against is the system of the use of money or what it's being used for. So we have to remember that. It's not, having money to do your work is not a bad thing, <laughs> is what I'm saying. I wanna make work, I want you to make work, 
But it's, uh, we must question where the funding is coming from, what are the inherent, I'm always thinking about that, what are the inherent institutional power relations with, I mean, with uh, subjects like minorities or natives or, you know, so. It's another question, a couple of hands. Um, I'm curious, you, th this is presented in an, an inter interesting contrast to last year at about the same time when a group called Survival International came here. And they're a group that, that's committed to m making documentary films for social justice. As far as I, as far as I understand, their practice is probably more complicated than that. Um, but, but something that I understand, and I think that you're questioning, and I think it's a Im really important but very fundamental question, is that um, capitalism loves problems when they're solved on the, its own terms. And so, you know, if, Dave, if uh, James Cameron came to this town and made a, made a film about it, and the dam was actually maybe even stopped, um, it, would be, it would be acceptable because it was made on, on, on capital's terms. Um, can, you, can you speak to that? I mean, it, it, it seems like you've, you've you're given us a good, a good question, but now, now we have to fight for, for other solutions. And, uh, and I'm and I'm curious if you've, if you've given that some thought. I had a thought as you were framing the question that the people themselves over there uh, don't see it as a problem. They see it as a way of life. Uh, the struggle is, like he was saying, that it's karma. That to, It's not a, pac a pacifist position. It's more that now let's go inwards and think. So what they've done in the last couple of years is that their diasporic community has come together for this cause. So I met some of them who have moved back from the cities and countries outside India to come back to fight for their land. So it's an interesting thing for me to think about that a struggle can bring people together and uh, uh, just voicing and having a conversation about it can hopefully, the new form is <laughs> on its way I don't know, I mean, uh, the, um, the alternative to this is, uh, I don't know, all of us, it's, I'm not looking for an alternative, but we should all be looking for it. I don't know if that answers your question, but relearning re, re through a struggle can be a way to think about reshaping a form. Because the forms exist, documentaries or storytelling or, you know, pedagogy and all of that exists. We can continue to have a famous person come in and do something about it. The dam can, you know, maybe that dam will be stopped. And then what? You know, the question is much larger. So it's not that I'm trying to shy away from answering, but I'm thinking as, as we all speak. Collective struggle, yeah. and if if we start, I mean, without conflating the issues, right? And that's a that's a really hard step to make. But I I, I commend the process of discussion to, to to do that. And I don't think that documentary does that enough. And I'm and I'm happy to see that that's happening now. I mean, uh, Abu Ghraib or or Guantanamo is certainly relevant in in some way. Yeah, I mean, this is also a, a, you know, a parallel story of all the things that you brought up here and what you were saying. I also suddenly remember that Iqbal Ahmed, um, another theorist culture, I don't know if anybody knows him, he passed away a decade ago, but um, he said, fight your battles organically, as in however you think of, the, wherever you find yourself, you fight that battle or a battle similar to it or within you, the ideas are endless of what you think of as a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, Ekbal Ahmad, um, E-Q-B-A-L-A-H-M-A-D, um, taught at Hampshire, and he 
wrote a really interesting piece on the work that he did in collaboration with the people who made the film, The Battle of Algiers, Gilo Ponte Corvo, who went on to make Burn with Marlon Brando and other interesting films. Um, and I highly recommend that piece, um, both for its his w discussion about working on, on, uh, on a film, but also his unbelievably lucid analysis of the Algerian Revolution, which is, he was a specialist kind of in, in critiquing um, counterinsurgency methods um, as practiced mainly by the United States government. And was a friend of Howard Zinn's and Noam Chomsky and was once accused of conspiring to kidnap Henry Kissinger. Um, but that was a rather fanciful charge. <laughs> Thank you for sharing the much more. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I only, I heard his lectures on tape when I was at Hampshire, yeah. but he was very inspiring. Uh, you mentioned earlier um, looking within. Uh, I read with great interest the UN Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, mm -hmm. and what it raised for me as a question was, what would it mean for each of us to be indigenous to the planet? Because often I think we think of indigenous people as them, but we're all native Yes. in that we're all born somewhere. So your point about looking within resonated with some of the comments in, the, in these clips. We're all native and, and yet there is race, class, and gendered ways of living. So if we were able to shed all of that and become, I hate to say the word one, <laughs> too cheesy. But yeah, I'm with you in that. The, the irony there is that we are all one, I mean, one big species, one collective unit that works together to really you know, kill all sorts of enemies selfishly. Uh, That's not what the law says. <laughs> That's not how and why the gadgets are being developed, or how the universities are run, or how, you know, it's true. I mean, how do I know if it's true, actually? I don't know. The world that we're living in doesn't give those signs. I feel more connected than ever. I feel absolutely more connected to the indigenous ever since the internet. Ever since the internet. But you've been uh, raising your hand for a while. Sorry. Oh, I have a microphone. So I'll ask my question, and then we'll pass oh, it that way. Sorry. Um, I guess there, yeah, there, you, you use the word raising awareness and raising consciousness, both. And so one question is, I wonder if you, if you think there's a value in differentiating those two things, oh. in particular relationship to this format of, um, right. by not having a narrative, it really sort of focuses on the people that you're showing, but also connects us to you. And I feel like this presentation, it's, it's for me, it's been mostly about like your relationship to the material and all the questions. Um, which is a super deep portrayal of, um, I don't know, I think all of us probably have some relationship to um, the difficulties of, that people are experiencing and the troubles of capitalism. So, but it, you know, it's, it's a unique situation to watch someone kind of process it in front of us. But yeah, so that to me seems like maybe there's something about raising consciousness because it's about people connection. So I just wonder if you could talk about that. If you yeah, I don't know if I've differentiated between awareness and consciousness, they're two separate things, but it, it can be performed in this room right now is what I was going for. That I, I mean, I can aim for a course to be developed in consciousness awareness or raising something, but I, I actually wanted to embody it in the night tonight, so I was thinking that what can I do to the room, like have people sit in the front, sit in a circle, have a little more intimate talk, which I don't mind either way, but there are some barriers when I stand here and you all sit there. So, you know, there, what, if, what if all these barriers broke away and we could actually have a different relationship to each other in relation to this material? So first, from this room outwards, we could be building something, both awareness and, we could be raising awareness and consciousness. So, you know, I don't know if I can um, think more than that because I, I wanna be present to our time here. This material is for us to 
for me first to be inspired to rethink how I am being in this world with friends and people and family and art material because I, I, I seem to be an artist. Um, but more also for me to communicate with us, you know, so. And actually, this may not even be important after a certain time. It's, we will become important, hopefully, and we will talk about things that we are doing. So it's not just consciousness. It's also action and our own relationships, even outside of this room. So I think, I don't know, it's hard for me to hard for me to contain this experiment. It's not really just an experiment. It's a way of life. I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm going to talk like this and be with this project for a while till I can answer successfully. I just want to explain that the, what you presented has been um, extremely frustrating in some capacity um, and its formlessness as an artist um, that on some level is required to create a form to, f to complete something at some point. Um, so the f and then the, the diversity of uh, subjects and uh, content and places that you, you could potentially um, delve into in terms of creating a form for this. Um, so there's over, like an oversaturation of information on the one hand, and um, so giving it form is something that I think uh, is desired on some level, in some concrete way. Um, yeah. I, I kind of appreciate that, be the frustration, because it, it really, I think, becomes a self-referential uh, process and that we are projecting are actively projecting onto the possibility of form, which I think is an exciting activity. Um, and that just by raising these questions and having this conversation in this space, I think is incredibly successful and that it's really important to the work that you're doing and the, and the, um, the material you're trying to get at. And I would, but I would also encourage uh, being incredibly uh, liberal in, in how you create form and that you could do it in any number of ways and to be very um, experimental or very uh, active in creating multiple iterations of the content in some, in one form or another. You for, mean visual form, visual form, form that can be seen, or or it's yeah. I mean, it, it, either through live presentation, through the photos, through the videos, you could take groups of people to this place. You could see um, again. I resist. Uh, I resist all of that because I said it in the beginning that actually, the form of us talking together, is the form that I am going to do. <laughs> I am not. Um, unaware of visual forms that are possible. So what about visual forms that you haven't thought about? Yes. I'm not unaware of even the visual forms that I am unaware of <laughs> or not, you know? <laughs> so what I'm trying to say, visual is, I want to rethink the visual through this. And the form of gathering and talking is a very traditional form that has been exercised in many parts of the world for centuries as an aesthetic. So I, I really do resist this idea that actually I am going to do something when actually I am doing something, you know? So the form of meeting and having these conversations and an ephemeral idea of uh, an experience that we share together cannot register as a complete form is already an interesting thing for me to work with. I'm compelled by that. But of course I'm aware that, you know, I, I can t show you the iterations that I have sent to publishers where I think this material has been published as images, as posters, as um, videos, as clips, as proposals, as, still hate to say the word documentary, counter documentaries maybe. Yeah, all of that can be done. And then what? Well, I guess I'm, my encouragement is to keep doing it is to be active in experimenting in 
the forms that this form or other forms that will give life to the content that you're doing that you're working with. It's not a, uh, yeah. a pigeonholing to one place or another. It's to actively continue to um, work with material in whatever capacity you think makes sense for yeah. this context or other contexts. No, I appreciate the the encouragement part. It's just that I am definitely resisting a containment to this matter. You know, this is not a story for me. So I don't know, we can work this through in a different question, but. Well, I just want to say that um, the form can continue tomorrow in the yes, seminar. <laughs> and I'd just like to uh, thank everyone for being here and for engaging. Uh, and thank Jezal for taking the chance to share that, this material and this approach and process and whatever. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank everyone. you. Thanks, everybody.